Recognized, Uncle Walker, D, 0, 1. Recognized, Emily of Arden, D, 1, 2. Recognized, Joe Moniak, D, 0, 5. Hello, team. Welcome back, and thanks for joining us for Episode 7 of Whelmed Season 4. My name is Rich, and with me is my co-host Emily and producer Neil. Hey, everyone. In these review episodes, we'll be diving into the plots, characters, Easter eggs, comic book history, and everything else of Young Justice, and use all of that as a springboard to talk about the creative writing process along the way. Our review segments will avoid any major spoilers for later episodes, but we'll be discussing them in detail in our final segment, Crashing the Mode. What was that? Nothing. Another hour and it'll be dark. Then... We move. Stay whelmed. Whelmed? And with all that out of the way, let's hand it over to Emily for... Hello, Megan! The title of this week's episode is The Lady or the Tigress. The release date was November 18th, 2021. The in-episode dates were April 20th through 21st. The writer was Nicole Dubuque. The director was Christopher Berkeley. And the voice director was, as always, Jamie Thomason. Special guest voice credits include Logan Browning as Onyx, Ben Diskin as Macal Maors, Zara Fuzzle as Cassandra Savage and Hawkwoman, Josh Keaton as Eric Needham and Black Spider, Brent Spiner as the Joker, Carrie Walgren as Joanne Maors, Hayden Walsh as Emery Johns, Gwendolyn Yao as Lady Shiva and Brictus. Just in time for your next mission. This week's episode opens on Mars, where Macal's gathering of white Martian extremists is interrupted by McGann just absolutely losing it and accusing McCom of intentionally killing Connor, only to find out that McCom had absolutely nothing to do with the kryptonite being added to the gene bomb. McCom then escapes through a boom tube and leaves McGann breaking down sobbing in Martian Manhunter's arms, looking for someone to blame for Connor's death. I'm fine. After the credits, Artemis, Onyx, and Cassandra Savage are taking the super cycle to Santa Prisca to rescue Orphan. Artemis also secretly has Oracle on comms, and Barbara reveals that the Arrow Vault's computer was breached during the break-in, meaning either Onyx or Cassandra must be a traitor carrying secret information back to the shadows. And on Santa Prisca, we see Lady Shiva has Orphan locked up and is berating her for joining the heroes, which leads us into a flashback of how Orphan was once sent to kill the Joker. Back on Mars, we find out that all of the kryptonite in the known universe is currently accounted for, meaning nobody has any idea who killed Connor. On Santa Prisca, Artemis, Onyx, and Cassandra are infiltrating the Shadow's base, with both possible traitors having ample opportunity to let the other die, but choosing to save each other. In that ongoing flashback, we find out that two years ago, the Joker found out that the Injustice League plot from way back in season one was actually just a ruse orchestrated by the light and that he was the only one who didn't know at the time. To get revenge against Vandal Savage for this deception, the Joker then planned to apparently blow up the United Nations because he's the Joker. The entire Bat family then arrived to thwart his plans and disable the bombs only for Orphan to arrive in the middle of the chaos. Back in the present, Oracle knocks out power to the Santa Prisca base so that Artemis and company can sneak into the facility. Back on Mars, McGann is getting ready to head back to Earth and Emery decides to tag along on the space road trip. And on Santa Prisca, Cassandra is officially revealed to be the mole, even using a glamour charm to fake that she had lost that arm. Oracle's flying drone finally locates Orphan, and we get the conclusion to that flashback. When Orphan went to kill the Joker, Batgirl ran to stop her, and Orphan ended up cutting Barbara instead, paralyzing her. But even bleeding out, Batgirl told Cassandra that she'd been trying to save her, not the Joker. And that's how Orphan joined the ever-growing Batfan. As one does. As one does, especially if your name is Orphan. Back on Pr- yep. Santa Prisca, Oracle successfully neutralizes the infiltrators that Cassandra mm-hmm, that Cassandra used to carry the League's secrets back to the island. But Artemis and Onyx are forced to face off against not only Cassandra, but Rictus and Shade as well. The odds are not in their favor until Cheshire drops from the ceiling and sets off a gas bomb that temporarily incapacitates their enemies. The group then races to save Orphan, only to be surrounded by a whole host of Shadow Guards and Lady Shiva, insisting that their only options are surrender or death. Let's feel some Aster. Superboy, are you alright? I'm fine. Feeling the Aster. So, who wants to go first? I... I have questions. 
I just have a question. I don't know. Maybe you guys know the answer to this question. What's your question, Rich? So I think I think I was confused about this and we talked about this when it first aired. I am totally on board for Barbara for everything that happened here that fixed the killing joke. I am on board. So they face like shadow ninjas all the time. What happened? How did I mean Barbara went to go save someone if she already knew that this girl was Shiva's daughter and all the horrible things that had happened to her and she didn't want her to take that first step of killing someone because you never walk away from that and all of that. Fantastic. I I didn't get that in this. Like, I don't know she did it to save her, but she didn't know who her was. I don't know. Did I did I miss something or do you guys have some input on that? I get, I get what you're saying. Like if she's willing to make that sacrifice knowing who it was but how did she know that that's who it was that's the question because she didn't take it she didn't even take her mask off until after the incident happened which is great but would would any of them have saved joker like it seemed like there was a very personal this was a very personal thing to save her and so knowing young justice and knowing greg and brandon there's probably a whole story behind it that we just didn't see but in this moment I was very conf- I was confused. She's like, "Oh, I didn't say I didn't do it to save Joker." And I'm like, "But he's the only one you know. Between the three of these people, there's you, Joker, and a random ninja." So I'm con- I I got a little confused on that. Having said that, I love the context of everything that happened. I just want to know how or like what where that motivation came from. So I would want I totally believe that they're the bat fam and they somehow knew all of this beforehand and oh whatever they know they know shiva they, they, sure. they know shiva i get it totally get that but even if you set that aside i think you could also even just make the argument that barbara saw someone across the room and was able to process that's a child like because orphan is supposed to look smaller and younger and even if there is this like mm. she's supposed to be mm-hmm. she's i don't remember what her age is supposed to be in those flashbacks but she's supposed to be young and if we are Pretty going young. by you know that's a that's a beautiful point i like that that barbara okay. could look across and see ah that's a child wearing full tactical gear and carrying a sword i don't know what's going on i'm stopping whatever is about to happen and i would absolutely believe that of barbara gordon as written in this show <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. I, I think I think that's probably the best thing I can, the the best explanation that, like, like accept that makes perfect sense. I also feel like I mean, come on, like in the in the comics, like Lady Shiva is like a whole thing in, in for the Bat Family. Yep. You know, like if I remember correctly, in the comics, Tim Drake was trained by her, like in the Robin miniseries from way back in the day. Part of it was like Shiva owed something, owed Batman something, and then trained Tim. I'd have to go back and look that up again. But I mean, like, she's always connected in with the Bat family. So them knowing or fi- figuring out something's happening there or who it could or might be, I could buy that. And the young kid thing, it, I mean, that sounds probably correct. What 14, do you think? 1415? No. Yeah, probably a, a young, small 1415. Uh, the other question, so I had questions, but they were just all, I, I I loved this episode. I loved so many things about this episode. The questions I have are like, all the known kryptonite in the universe is accounted for. Okay. If you have, if you have Justice League resources, that's going to be sure. something you keep track of. I mean, and we've already established that the javelin goes at uh, incomprehensible speed. But one, that's some serious accounting. That's my guess. And also, who has that? Who has it? Who'd they go to? Who did they knock on the door and say, excuse me, do you have your three and a half pounds of red kryptonite secured? Great. Oh, Thanks man, so I'm much. I'll let you guys know. I uh, sold that last week. <laughs> I sucked half a pound of it up a vacuum cleaner, but I'm sure it's fine. Like, I'm like, who's got this? And is it all the colors? Do we have the colors? We haven't had any reference to the different colors of kryptonite in this show, have we? I don't think so. No. So, but I'm just like, yeah, where is that? And also, you know, Batman has like, some the, of it. <laughs> that's all we know. That's the only <laughs> one we know. <laughs> yep. 
And did I guess they know? I I suspect in this show the relationship isn't like as antagonistic at all as as a lot of the other like Dark Knight Returns and stuff. So I think Clark's like, here, can you hang on to this in case something goes terribly wrong and kill me? Bruce will be like, yep, got you, buddy. And then stick it in the back cave. And guess what? It happened. So there you go. Anyway, I just want to know who's just got piles of kryptonite sitting somewhere. You know what I mean? Yeah. Or like, even it's like, a did you go to, did you go to, even just did you go bit. to Lex? Like, does Lex have I, some? Did you just go to Lex? Did you, I mean, Lex usually has some yeah. from somewhere, but like, did he tell anybody about it? Anyway, that was my thing. <laughs> and honestly, I felt really, <laughs> felt really dumb when Oracle's like listing off like the entire bad family going after Joker and Two Face, or not Joker, a Penguin and Two Face. And I was like, I had to go back and listen to it a couple times. I'm like, did you say Kate? Who's Kate? I had to think about it for a second. Uh, I was like, Batwoman. oh, Batwoman. Yep. Right. Batwoman's in this season. Kate, Kate. I totally forgot. In the show. And, like, and does oh, it I'm have any and it, lines? And it doesn't have any lines. And I, I, I looked it up and I was like, oh, it's because I never hear it referred to as Kate. I think they did that with the Batman, with the Batwoman um, TV series. And they might do it in the comics, but I always reference in my brain. It's always Kathy. Because the original bad one was Kathy Kane. So I, that's what's in my head. So I couldn't, I don't know, I just felt, I was like, oh, okay, I feel ridiculous now. <laughs> of course it's bad woman. I think she's been Kate Kane for a while since the kind of like, I want to say like early 2000s reboot, like the version that gave her like the red hair and the suit and like the, what is now the iconic kind of Batwoman look. She'd gone by Kate instead of Kathy. She's been going on with that. Yeah, oh, gotcha. I think right, so. Cool. I can't remember for sure. It's been a long time since I read uh, that kind of OG reboot of Batwoman. But yeah, I well, think that's I also, you know, there. I'm old. So there you go. Anyway. Yeah. And also, I want to I want to know this this Penguin Two-Face turf war thing. Because sometimes the Batfam is just dealing with the weird nonsense that happens in We're Gotham. Dealing with stuff. Still, it may be. A full DC Universe show, but that does mean that sometimes Batman is not working with the Justice League. Sometimes Batman's just doing stuff in Gotham. I love the old, uh, from the first season, you know, the old, uh, he's with, uh, Robin's with Batman doing the dynamic duo thing. Well, and we we never see Penguin at any point. And the only reference to Two Faces, uh, potentially, this is a deep cut. This is a very deep cut. This isn't even. This is even beyond. Like, go read the tie-in Do comics. It. This is go get the free comic book day that it was divided between two stories of it and Batman: The Brave and the Bold, where it was called Face Your Fears because you had oh, what's the guy Psychonaut? That's not right. But oh no, Psycho Psycho Pirate. <laughs> That's why I didn't remember because his name is Psycho Pirate. Comics. But yeah. he basically forces them into like a dreamlike state, and we potentially see a two faced looking individual as close as um, we've been, but potentially more, but only in comic. Yeah, that, and we see uh, Two Face's lair, and I think it's one of the invasion comics for just one shot that shows like what Batman and I think Tim are like doing during something in the. The like pre invasion oh, yeah. comics, there's one shot of them and they're like talking over comms to somebody else. And if you look, you're like, that looks like Two Faces Lair. Isn't it? Isn't it? It's like an apartment yeah. shot that's split down the middle. That's right. Yep. It's split down the middle, but the shot is like at an angle so that it's a little harder to process right. that that's exactly what it is, but that's what it's supposed to be. That's funny. Oh, yeah. We've never seen Penguin. He's just around. Gosh, it's so funny. It's just so funny to me that like it's. DC comic show, and I'm just like, yeah, I guess maybe Joker, Poison Ivy, Riddler. Yeah, we've seen a lot of the bat, the old bat. Uh, Rogues gallery. Thank you. That's the word I was looking for. Huh. Yeah, I'd love to see it. I mean, they did a tie in comic thing the last time Wally said they're in Gotham doing the dynamic duo thing. Pretty sure we got a we got a uh, story with that of what they were doing at yeah. that time. So I'd like to see this. It is in the yeah. tie in comics. Neil, to answer your point, I do think that the free comic book day, like issue zero or whatever it's technically called, like does exist now in like one of the. uh, Um, Yeah, compilations, compilations. I think it's in one of like the reprint compilations that exist now the same way that like the uh, digital exclusive uh, Torch Songs one is also in one of those now. Like, I think when they made those, they're like, just put everything in there 
yeah. everything we so have. To, That's good. I had to hunt it down on eBay just to read it because there wasn't even digital copies. I had it as reprinted in a uh, like the DC Nation magazine that it came with that and a uh, Green Lantern comic. Oh, yeah. Fun facts. I think I bought it in a Barnes and Noble. I think the only other thing I, I uh, had that I wanted to comment on because I, I saw what you guys wrote down. Yep. We got lots of notes. It's good stuff. We got lots of notes. Uh, the only other thing that I that I wanted to add was that, um, wow, McGann. Hey, it's a room full of Martians. Everybody have a seat. I'm coming through. I got thoughts. Like, oh. <laughs> I got notes. Uh, yeah. It's like, I got oh, notes. You got, okay, you got it. You all got the same powers, except, you know, it's kind of a technique thing. Yep. So I'm just going to I'm just going to wreck all of you. I got it. I got a place to be. And uh, I was like, man, I just just being on the receiving end of angry McGann is not good. Yeah, I as my first note says, I just genuinely absolutely love McGann just kind of losing it like. It's yeah. such a good scene and it's done so well. And it's that thing of showing how powerful she has gotten and also how much more control she has over that power yep. now. Cause this was a whole, it was a whole thing on the internet of going, wait, did McGann just kill everybody in that room? No, yeah. <laughs> we, yeah. we have word of Greg on Twitter confirming that they're all just knocked out. It's fine. But like, it's an amazingly done moment of McGann just walking in decking everyone in the room and just being on a war path uh it's what we refer to as galadriel darkness began that's right it is the terrifying demigod side of that dual mcgann persona uh that we love to talk about and it's just very cool to see and like there's back in the scream somethings we joked about me and neil had a thing where when when connor died i remember us saying in like our uh, crashing the mode. I was like, how long until McGann just absolutely loses it and goes after McCom? Two episodes. That's how long it takes for <laughs> that's McGann. The answer. That's the answer to get question. to answer that question. You know what? And also another shout out to her um, design this season yes. too, because like she just and you when you I look at it and I'm just like, there she is. That's why I think she is. I think she's settled on everything that she should be. This is narratively why we need to have McGann have long hair so that when she loses it, it can float Mm -hmm. and be terrifying. (laughs) It's there for narrative purposes, not just because it's my favorite. She planned that. Do you want this to hang in the front, the back? You know what I want? I want it to look like this when I'm angry. (laughs) And that's what she went to her, the old. She doesn't need a hairstylist, Rich. She can just transform. She still has to go there to get ideas. That's what I, I kind of stopped what I was saying because I was like going, suddenly everything I'm saying makes no sense. But you're right. Yeah, she could walk in and go like, hey, what do you think? Yeah, there you go. Okay, thanks. I also love that John did nothing. John's like, you just got to let this play out. Well, then I also thought like the version, like if there were someone else there, like that conversation that harkens back of, we're not here for this part. And then, you know, when he holds her and she's oh. crying, it's we're here. I'm here for this part. I'm here for this part. Yeah. yeah. Also, I, I can do literally nothing about the other part. I have no ability to do anything about the <laughs> yeah. other part. Yep. <laughs> He's like, do you remember that time 12 years ago when she took over my brain? I don't think I can stop her. So I think I'm good. Remember yeah. the last time that uh, McGann thought Connor died and she just accidentally, you right. know, took over an entire <laughs> mental training simulation. <laughs> right. Exactly. But I am curious as to why, like, so McCom pulls out a father box, pops up a boom tube, takes off. Got it. Uh, not I. It, John like physically went after him. I'm like, that's cool. You chased him, and then I thought about it. And I was like, wait, don't you have telekinesis? Sometimes you forget, Rich. Sometimes I guess. you forget what she can do. Was, you ever and, uh, lost your glasses like, while they're on your face? <laughs> Sometimes you forget you have telekinesis, Rich. I am in this picture, and I don't like it, Emily. <laughs> I don't think I, I don't think I like this reference at all. Um. Anyway, don't call me out like that. But anyway, I I mean, I could see like the Martians being able to like block telekinesis. Like I have telekinetic powers. You have telekinetic powers. I can like block what you do, things like that. But I just thought it was interesting. I was like, oh, no, John's just going to go grab him. I'm like, interesting. Yeah, we lost you okay, on the one cool. side of a portal already this yeah, season. He's probably also like, maybe Stop. I'm not going to go through this boob too. <laughs> maybe, maybe no. 
<laughs> almost got blown up a few episodes ago, so maybe no. Uh, my other note about this scene that I think is so good and is such a cool opening to this episode is I know that we chatted about it back during Scream Somethings, but I've got to bring it up that I remember us kind of thinking that it was it was odd when the season first premiered that the first stretch of episodes, none of them were written by Nicole Dubuque because we often think of her as a very like writing a lot of the iconic McGann and Super Martian episodes only for this episode to premiere and us. Uh, me and Neil did joke about like, oh, we were saving her for the McGann has a terrifying, heart wrenching breakdown episode. Got it. That's what we we needed to hold <laughs> Nicole to view back so she could do this. Right. And it's great. It's very good. Yeah. No, rewatching it and the way that she just breaks down and says, "Who do I blame?" and that being the last line of the scene, you're like, oh, oh, okay. I'll just I'll just sit with those emotions for a bit. It's so well done, and it's so painful as a result. <laughs> what else do I got here? Moving away from uh, McGann having a breakdown and me crying about it, uh, I have a couple of little notes here that include um, that one of the books on Oracle's desk, if you look closely during the scenes that are in Oracle's apartment, is short stories by Frank R. Stockton, who wrote The Lady or the Tiger, which is where the title of the episode mm-hmm. comes from. It's the yeah. story that Artemis basically narrates uh, as ambiance for the whole episode, which is cool. And it's a cool little Easter egg. I'm looking up like, when when was he? When did he live? Long ago. 1834 to 1902. Because he makes this... Hold on. Let me see if I can figure this math out. Oh, yeah. Okay, so Schrodinger... And this guy were alive around the same time. Because this is literally like at some point they're making a reference in the stuff that Artemis is reading out loud about like both things exist at the same time until you open the door. And I was like, oh, it's Schrodinger's tiger. And so I was wondering, did this guy make this reference before Schrodinger's cat's mental experiment or vice versa? I'm I'm not sure. But they were both alive about the same period of time in history. So I'm wondering if one referenced the other or vice versa. Yep. And this, for me, uh, <laughs> rewatching this and just hearing this again, uh, reminded me of there was that thing online that I don't remember if either of you saw this, but there was a stretch of time online, uh, maybe a year or two back, where everyone was just sharing uh, their examples of what was the short story that your English teacher casually handed you in high school that then like broke your brain and changed your life. Uh, and like this has that energy to it of, a, of an English teacher just handing this out on a Thursday morning and everyone being like, wait, you can do that? You could just do that in a story? Because it's cool. It's an interesting one. I hadn't heard of it until this episode. But yeah, it's cool. It's interesting. Oh, really? You've never heard? Oh, I've always heard it. It's always I've heard it referenced in a bunch of stuff, but I've never heard the whole short story. Yeah. So there's. Yeah, there's a lot of like that. For some reason, I want to feel I'm feeling like in the 80s when I was watching, you know, animated stuff. Sometimes they would have this. It would would, that people reference like you get to pick the door. You know, is it the lady or the tiger? Or they like make like a passing reference to it, oh. but not indeed, de- not in detail like this. And I've never read the whole story. So I'm assuming this is all or most of that story put together, which it, it's gorgeous. It's beautifully written. So I'm going to go back and read the original. I'm going to do g- give me one Google search and I'll find out if it's the whole thing or not. Yeah, it's basically the entire plot of the story is related in Artemis's bit. I just was looking it up. Yeah, it ends. They never tell you which door that she picked. It's the whole thing of just of. Oh, yeah. It's the exact thing of leaving it open to the reader that I can absolutely see happening in a high school English class of just having the whole classroom be like, so which one do you think it was? Talk about it. Why? Which one's worse? Kind of thing. That's and it's very interesting. And I like it. I like that. I like the phrase like after it's like after days of pondering. The answer her choice was made in a moment. So whatever she was thinking about the whole time and thinking maybe she should or shouldn't do didn't matter. She just followed her gut, like followed, followed that. That moment was the choice, whether or not she decided to do something differently early or not. Cause she loses them either really... way. That's the whole point. It's neither of them yeah. is a good option for her. It's which do you pick for the other person? And it's the whole thing. It's interesting. It's very cool. Literature, man. I have an English degree. Yes. 
Speaking of words, I love the ongoing bit of everyone on the team using team slang around people who yes. aren't part of the team. <laughs> um, it is they will. <laughs> so true to how groups of friends work, and I love it. <laughs> Of like Artemis has been using that word for 10 years and has never once been like, oh, right. Other people don't know what that mm -hmm. means. Um, and that's great. I love it. And I then get to my bigger note that I forgot to bring up when we were talking about the killing joke earlier. But I just wanted to say uh, that I just I because we were talking about questions and how this happened and why Barbara did what she did. Aside from all of that, I just really like oh, yeah. this reworking of this so much more than if they had just done a straight retelling of that story. I like that this version links Barbara's injury to her heroism and her own choices rather than her just being literal collateral damage in a Batman-centric narrative. I like that it's done in a way that doesn't feel sensationalized and exploitative. And I know I was really pleased in season three when we didn't have to sit through the killing joke, but I'm also personally pleased that we did get an answer like a full season later. We're getting an answer that feels more respectful than the original narrative ever did. Like even little things like we've talked about how the gore in this scene is to me handled with a level of care that some other stuff of a similar nature later this season maybe is is not. But I think it's really important in this scene that it is not sensationalizing that injury. It's not turning it into something wild or disgusting. It is just something that is happening. And like even little things, I like that Nightwing is the one who is absolutely freaking out and is trying to call back up to save her. It's good. It's a nice little moment. We only get so many moments between them. We will take what we can get. I also like that the entire rest of the Bat fam gets to just punch Joker in the face. <laughs> there was something deeply satisfying about deeply every cathartic. one of those punches. Yeah, cathartic is the actual word. Yes, thank you. And at the same time, I also think it is interesting and intentional that in that montage, Batman's kind of just absent from it. Of like, we are again not centering Batman in this moment that is happening to Barbara and that is about like her family, quote unquote, taking it out on the Joker. We are. Batman is getting something else done. Batman is calling it a helicopter or whatever. And that's really interesting, considering if you look at the original Killing Joke narrative, it is all about Batman. It is a thing that happens right. to Barbara, but it is not about Barbara. And so I just, I like all of that. I think all of it is a lot of really good choices that make that scene work really well. Even like the more stylized things of like the heartbeat and the fading in and out of stuff. Like it's good it works it is a very intense but well done scene that tells us so much about that backstory that we hadn't gotten an answer to up until this point it's also a really satisfying way for orphan to join the team and creates a bond between the two those two that i don't remember reading when i read the batgirl comics that had orphan in it i don't i don't I mean, I could, somebody can let us know if I'm missing something, but like, I don't remember them having this sisterly relationship, you know, in the comics from the very, from the original. Before she became orphan, she was Batgirl for a while in the comics. So there's always a deep, there's a deeply personal reason for someone to be involved in the family and to make choices, you know? Yeah. I think the other thing to note is, and I think it's a really important piece, is that this story still centers the, joker as the villain that's the yes. inciting event i think that it had he not i don't think it would have gone as well had he not been there and you still have the like the true darkness of the joker i mean you also have him saying horse puckies but you also have the idea that he's going to murder the entire united nations representative including Le lex luther there as well and then to also have his very dark version of that's ridiculous. That is the funniest thing you could have done is to sacrifice yourself. Seemingly, you know, his interpretation is for him is like to make anyone not kill me. How ridiculous you you are, Bat family. This is why I enjoy messing with you. And then, yeah, the catharsis of 
many punches. Also, we still do not know who A33 is. Wait, say that again? So what? Robin calls for A33, which is one of the authorized guest systems inside the oh. um, designations. And as far as I can tell, that is still an unknown. Huh. It, it, it didn't. Do you remember? Do you remember from the tie-in comics and also the episode with uh, in Nightmare Monkeys? There's the medics. Do you think it's the medics? Those two medics that keep showing up. They got them on the payroll. Do you now? know who like, I'm talking about? Maybe I, authorized. I mean, it's well, we got a lot of problems. That's pre- we got therapists, but now we need <laughs> medical professionals. <laughs> I mean, you get a couple medics on the team. That'll be really helpful. I'm wondering. Anyway. But related to that, I also wanted to, with this scene, if I'm doing my math right, everyone feel free to correct me. Either of you feel free to correct me if I'm wrong on this. This event happens, this flashback happens two years before season four, right? Which means that it happened pretty recently before the start of season three, right? Like that's how that timeline works out. That's really interesting. I don't know. I just sometimes I like figuring out the timeline and just thinking about how interesting it is because I feel like going into season three, we we don't get any idea of how long Barbara has been in a wheelchair at the start of season three. So it's interesting to have more of a timeline on that and to know that it is pretty recently before the start of season three. By the power of Ask Greg number Yes. Two, five, I Neil. summon forth the power of. <laughs> I don't know. I just feel like making them more ridiculous because they're really straightforward. And there's not a lot there. So I'm embellishing this system. <laughs> 25706. Joker Bomb was in January of Teen Year, which is, of course, between set between seasons two and three. Um, and by the end of everything, Orphan ends up staying with or staying at Wayne Manor. And that's according to Ask Greg, 26. 271 for those keeping track at home i don't know why you would but the idea then i think it's roughly like maybe like later that year that she's joining the team i think like september somewhere i read yeah no that's just it's interesting now this is also me just trying to figure out timeline things in my mind of going okay are nightwing and batgirl together at the point of that flashback do you think Neil is nodding silently. Rich is nodding silently. I also think I also get that from that flashback. I'm just interested because we we don't have answers to some of these things. Guesses must be made. But I like that. I just they're together in season three. We never got any confirmation in season three of how long they have been together. It's just interesting. I don't know. These are the these. This is the math that we do on this show. Joker says that, right? He's like, I'm eight years late or something like that. And so I was trying to do the math in my head, too. I think you're right. What do you got, Neil? So it's interesting to tie back all the way to Infiltrators in so many ways. Because you have the flashbacks, and that's Artemis's like earliest appearance in the show. Uh, yeah. As well as, and it's also interesting. I don't know why I do this. It's not different any time I do it. But I actually go back and watch the two clips, like the clips that they cut. They're they're a hundred percent just forklifted into the episode and then put yeah. like a bit of a like a filter over it to imply that it is a um, a flashback, which is really interesting because if you watch them side by side directly, there there's more clarity when it's happening in season one than it almost has like a slight blurred filter for it being a back uh, uh, flashback when we're watching it in season four. But also, I love that there are, these are clearly different infiltrators, and we'll learn more later about that but i also just think it's funny because then barbara's like ah, dick already solved this problem like 10 years ago ah, fixed it <laughs> don't worry about it they're gone now it just problem solved it just felt like a very big thing that was solved with like i pushed my infiltrator button and now and don't worry about it don't worry about all that information that was stolen i have solved it it's it's different though it's actually different though because she says she uses the sonic a sonic pulse so she uses a sonic pulse to take them out because I thought the same thing. I'm like, why would you even, why would you even use this stuff? Like they already fixed it. But I think it was it, it was a it was an antivirus the last time. This time she just hit him with some kind of s- pulse from the from the device. Yeah, we will we will we'll get more information on how they're different different next episode. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But yeah, they're cool. I do I do love Oracle just being able to do stuff. 
I love Oracle just hitting some buttons on her keyboard and making the problem go away. I also, while well, I'll get, I'll, my 16 is that they infiltrate Santa Prisca in section 16. That's what they reference. Uh, um, but that's your big, that's your big one. Also, I don't know how I haven't asked this question up until now. Can other people see when the team members eyes, I mean, for us, like as the viewer, um, it's very notable that a person's eyes just start glowing a different color when they're accessing the heads up display. Is that something that people in world see? Cause it's, if so, it's pretty notable that, you know, your eyes are glowing a bright green. Was it green? And I feel like it's blue, orange. Some other, I orange. Uh, yeah. I, it, I there are like different the, ones for different people's oh, costumes. I'm pretty sure. Yes. There. Yeah. <laughs> Artemis is are orange. Uh, Nightwings are blue, et cetera, et cetera. I think. <laughs> Reg- regardless of color, they are changing <laughs> and glowing. Is that what people, that would be very obvious? A good question that we don't have answers I, I, for. I, I don't have an answer to that one for Perfect. you. Perfect. Well, that's all I've got. I will, I'm done on that question. Did you have anything else, Emily? My last note. My last note is uh, Emery McGann and uh, Martian Manhunter on Baby Bioship. Truly, really is just going to be the most awkward road trip back to Earth. That just that credits of them just sitting silently <laughs> through a space. Month. A month. <laughs> a <Yeah>. month. <laughs> ah! mm-hmm. We'll check back in with that later. But gosh, when this first premiered and even watching it back now, I'm like, this just feels like it would be so difficult for everyone involved. Just don't talk. Everyone's That's sad. So difficult, right? No one wants to talk. <laughs> Everybody's just going to stare out into the vast expanse of space. And this spaceship is going to do her best to keep this family from falling apart. <laughs> <laughs> we got to keep this family from falling apart. I just have that playing in my head right now. <laughs> All right. Are we ready for some? Uh... All right. Well, let's head into debrief. A little fan service and crash in the mode. Stick around. Class is in session. In our Canary Debrief section, we'll be discussing what we can learn about the creative process from the episodes we review. Today, we're going to be talking about paying homage while making it your own. If you don't know that that's going to be a direct reference to the killing joke, well, here you are. Because inevitably, that is something that is well known throughout the DC fan community as a point of contention as to its original execution. But at the same time, it holds an important place in the DC fandom and those stories that are told. So having it retold here in the way that it was is a perfect illustration of how to pay homage to that while making it its own thing and existing in the world of Young Justice as it was meant to be. There's no question. A few things about paying homage and making it work correctly is that you really need to take the time to truly understand the original material. Um, Obviously it's going to be different short of talking to the person that directly wrote that original material. But one of the things is trying to really figure out its context, its history and the original intentions of the creator of that material. Like the, the deep understanding and foundation upon which you can build is the most important part because secondarily you have to identify the elements of that original work that are basically untouchable. Um, Barbara ending up in a wheelchair is a key component of that storyline. Having the Joker there, I could, I could see an argument from both directions, but for me personally, I think having the Joker there is another untouchable changing the scenario beyond that, I think works really, really well as it did here in this episode. But you as the person writing this, or if it's a painting or if it's, anything. You have to find the heart of that story, determine what for you are untouchable, and then start moving forward because then that's the point at which your personal creativity comes into play. Basically, you're understanding and respecting the elements and reinterpreting or reimagining them through your own lens into possibly a completely different medium or just making sure it fits into the world and story that you're creating while paying homage and not forklifting it wholesale into there because that 
that reads that way for those that are really deeply familiar with the original content. If it is just copy paste, then it doesn't read the same way. Read or watch or whatever version. I think the other thing, and this is probably the finest point of balance in paying homage to something is basically having it not overshadow the original work because you're wanting it to be its own piece of material. And basically you're trying to make it this, your new interpretation is an innovative piece while not being completely unrecognizable. So basically paying homage while making something your own is about respect, understanding, creativity, and acknowledgement. It involves taking something established and loved and carefully adding your own personal touch to create something familiar yet new, respectful yet innovative. This approach allows for both the celebration of the original piece as well as your own expression of creativity, bringing the past and the present together. I've uh, admired your stance on animal rights for years. In fan service, we take some time to highlight the amazing fan-related creations celebrating DC, Young Justice, and other creative works we think Young Justice fans will love. Uh, we missed the mark on this one, but, dear listener, if you're wanting to ring in the new year with the team from Season 1, then start Season 1, Episode 26, at 11.40 p.m. and 53 seconds to start 2025 with the original crew. A uh, huge shout out to over on the Young Justice Reddit, uh, specifically from user significant ad 8416 for this post. So I I saw it. I thought I would share it. Um, but yeah, huge shout out. And now we know how we here at Whelmed will ring in 2025. Tell us something we don't know yet. Sorry, BB. We can't risk altering the time stream. We do that. We're all feeling the mode. Our earlier segments assume listeners have only seen up to this episode in season four. In Crash in the Mode, we'll be discussing spoilers and foreshadowing for future episodes, as well as plot elements from the original DC storylines that may affect what we see later on. We may also drop theories and speculations about what's to come based on wild flights of fantasy. Or also fancy. Wild flights of fantasy. Or fancy. They're both similar. Also, has- hashtag Halo's mother box. Hey, did you guys know that Connor's not dead? Hey, did you know that Beast Boy's hurting. Dr. Jace did nothing wrong. No, okay. that is not the no, official not stance true. of that's this podcast. <laughs> yes, we know We know for sure now, Neil. <laughs> it's not. Listen, nothing is okay. I wasn't saying she wasn't bad. I only <laughs> was saying that she, what? she was manipulated a whole lot and is bad. Wait, no. None of that has anything to do with this episode. No, I, but I do have a question about this episode, but then it goes back okay. more to the arc structure because I know before we jumped on, one of my things was I did a full rewatch straight through season one into two. And in a lot of ways, there's like for my brain, there's almost like that's kind of the really big dividing point of season three and four really work very well together in season one and two. Like, you know, the feel of those while so much is the same, they're like that's kind of that break point for me. Now that said, yeah, yeah. these were set up as arcs. Again, I think that as a community, um, it was overassumed what that meant, um, so that expectations were set, unreasonably so, for what arcs would be. Now, all of that to say, what, w- what if we weren't getting the Mars cutbacks? What if it was just 100% in Unlike the Artemis Croc win set situation, and like, what if that's all we saw for these episodes? How would that feel? I'm just trying to think of like because I'm trying to think from like the expectations of that because I didn't have them, but the expectations of like yeah. very set yeah. arcs. We only look at these people because the first arc felt very much that way. And what if that had continued of like we don't talk we don't talk about Mars. And then we would only look in on this situation. Yeah, I think that would. It's the thing of I think that would make a quote unquote more cohesive arc from the perspective of people who really wanted just an Artemis focused arc, but would make an overall much weaker season because all of the arcs have to eventually intertwine for us to have an overarching season. And I think all of those little emotional moments that we get 
throughout the rest of this season that are cutting to things that aren't necessarily tied directly into the like central character of each arc are still important for us to get where the story's going. But I do understand at the same time why a lot of people were in some ways frustrated by the fact that like the first arc of the season set a tone for the idea of what a lot of people had of what these arcs were going to be. And then from then on, it's not like that because it can't be because there's too much going on. You got to have some kind of callbacks or something that's allowing you to kind of move that story forward, you're saying, yeah? Because if we just didn't see anything with McGann or Mars or any of that stuff happening until like the end of this season when it's like everybody get together and save Connor... I feel like a lot of people would be like, wait, but what was going on? And why is why is Emery here now? And what's what is all this kind of thing? And you'd be confused and it would yeah. feel weird to not check in with that emotional beat when like Connor's death is a central theme of this season for us to later undo it. If we don't talk about it until we do something about it then it's not really planting and payoff. It's just like a plot thread that would have felt like it was dropped until it wasn't. So it's like you need those callbacks and you need those little check-ins. But I do understand at the same time how a lot of people were like, but this is supposed to be the Artemis arc and why are we doing this, that, and the other thing? Um, Yeah, like the execution of it would, I mean, they would have to be very different. Yeah. You'd have to wrap those more in bows. And I think the, the closest thing I can equate it to is the first phase of Marvel where they referred to it as Fury's big week because all like Iron Man one Thor, all of that for him, for Nick Fury happens within like the span of a single week. We'd almost have to have something akin to that and having that last arc be your basically your Avengers arc. No, and it's just a thought experiment because like I've also said, watching season four as a single, just like put it on and run through it. Oh gosh. I had a lot more fun just watching it, especially after subsequently watching uh, the rest of the series. But I was just trying to think of like, okay, so what does like a a shorter run of Young Justice look like? You're saying you had a lot more fun, like because it was compressed, it wasn't spread out. Mm -hmm. They didn't have the, oh, by the way, suddenly we're dropping two episodes on a day with no warning, those kinds of things. Yeah, and you also just have everything kind of happening closer because as we we're in crashing mode, right? Just double checking. Okay, yes. Yep. I was yes, gonna say are. that yeah. but like we don't learn much about Lord Zod until you know, much later yeah. in the season, which is totally fine once if I'm just sitting there and I can crank through our an arc a day rather than a month, just three months later, finally finding out who's who's in the bubble. Yeah. Yeah, I was just trying to think of like, okay, well, you know, if those expectations were met, yeah, like you said, I think it would it would have created, Emily, you, I, you put it best in that it would have created better cohesive arcs, but not a better season. Yeah. I'm on board. That's my vote. I think especially like the example you made, like comparing it to MCU stuff is like, because this season of Young Justice stretches out over so much time, like that idea, like to do something like that, I think you would have had to be like, hey, every single arc of this season of Young Justice is happening during the same week where no one's talking to each other kind of thing, which doesn't really work with the way Young Justice does structure most of the time. Like there's an alternate universe where that could have happened and it could have been interesting, but like, Young Justice has kind of set up that thing of like every new episode time has passed since the next one and every and like only rarely and generally in tie in comics do we do a and this was happening at the same time kind of thing. So, yeah, no, again, it's like it's a thing that's interesting to think about, but I'm not I feel like it would have it would have created different problems. Like I get what some of the problems people have with the season are, but like trying to solve those problems would have created different possibly worse problems um and so it's just it's just a thing yeah storytelling it's complicated yeah and also like neil was saying earlier too the expectations right yeah once you have it once you use a particular piece of language then that language doesn't always mean the same thing to different people yeah so all right anybody else have any modes to crash i have 
I made a comment. I made some comments earlier that I was reminded were crashing the mode, but I will save them for the next episode and talk about them then. So you guys good? Anything else you want to do? Halo's mother box. Hunter's not dead. <laughs> Hashtag why not friendship. Okay. All right. That sounds great. And with that, I think we can say that out of the watchtower. If you'd like to join us in discussing this incredible series, you can find us on Twitter at the YJ Files, on our website, crashingthemode.com, and you can even email us at whelmedpodcast at gmail.com. You can also find us on YouTube, Stitcher, Spotify, and iHeartRadio. And if you'd like to support our show, please consider sharing it with a friend and joining our chats on social media. You can also support the show by giving us a five-star review and or rating on Apple Podcasts or your podcatcher of choice. The ratings, comments, and subscriptions help others find the show. If you do leave us a rating, please let us know at our email address or on social media, especially if you're outside the U.S., as we have to look a little bit harder to find those. If you are able to support us monetarily, please consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash crashing the mode. Even a dollar a month can help us bring you even more awesome discussion sessions, interviews, reviews, and more. And remember, stay stay well, well, everyone. You've been listening to Whelmed, the Young Justice Files podcast. Our hosts are Rich Howard and Emily Booza. Our editor and producer is Neil Powell. Our theme was composed by Emily Mio. Our logo was created by Kevin Bates. Whelmed is a fan-made podcast and is not officially affiliated with DC Comics, DC Entertainment, Warner Brothers Animation, and any other owners of Young Justice or its related source material. As such, these companies have sole ownership of all symbols, images, names, logos, and proprietary material related to Young Justice. Original content of this podcast is ours under Creative Commons. Thanks for listening, and stay whelmed. Stay whelmed.